need. It says live. Yep. No. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Coach's Corner this Friday night. I'm happy to bring on some new guests tonight to talk about injuries and not only how can we spot them, but how can we deal with them when they happen and even how we can prevent them. Uh, which is probably the most important part, as we all know, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So uh, tonight I'd like to welcome uh, Sir Attila to the show for the first time. A uh, friend of mine, he goes, well, tremendous background in physiology and rehab and all kinds of stuff that I can't even recount, uh, but I'll let him go a little into his background. We have um, also Nicolina. What is your title, Nicolina? Maestra. Ma Maestra <laughs> Nicolina, thank you. Um, welcome her to the show for the first time. Uh, and of course, uh, Sir Elizabeth, who is a normal, a regular uh, coach here on Coach's Corner. So welcome, everybody. Hi, everyone. All right. Attila, maybe you could go a little bit into your background for us. I know he's uh, he's got a robust background, so I'll let him describe it. Uh, specifically for the SCA, uh, things that what's going to be uh, beneficial for us today is uh, my degrees are in nutrition and fitness, athletic training, exercise science, and a master's in physical therapy. Uh, even though I'm currently not practicing that, I've practiced for well over a decade and I've worked on hundreds of specifically SCA people and then a couple thousand of other people. So injuries are a problem. We can help. And that's me. Excellent. Uh, Nicolina, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I am nowhere near as impressive as Attila, um, but I do have a passion for ergonomics and figuring out how to uh, how to use uh, proper technique in order to reduce the chances of injury. I really screwed my knee up when I was in my early 20s fencing, and so it's a priority for me to uh, learn how to not do that again and to teach people how to how to avoid that, that in the future. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and my background, I, I was a role marshal of, of North Shield for a, a period of time. During that time, uh, we had a couple of, of rather mysterious head injuries. Uh, and we're going to get into that uh, in more depth a little later in the episode. But as an athlete, I took it upon myself to find out as much as I could about not just performance, but how to maintain my body. I did go, uh, like Nicolina, I got injured a number of times, had a couple of knee strains, uh, an elbow dislocation problem that led to surgery. I had to find out how to recover from that. It's been one of those learn as I go, and I've, I've sought out experts, Attila being one of them, uh, for how to maintain an athlete's body. And in doing so, discovered that I wished I had started that journey much, much sooner uh, I've learned a great deal along the way, uh, and so I wanted to pass along what I've learned both through personal experience, the, the trial and error, and as well as gotten wise words from, from people who have been much more experienced than myself. Uh, so with that, before we start this episode, I want to put this as a disclaimer that none of us are pretending to be doctors, none of us are handing out medical advice of any kind. Um, but we as athletes need to know our bodies, need to know some, some basics of how to understand what's going on in our body, understand what an injury is, and how to responsibly deal with it. So listening to this episode is not going to turn you into a medical professional, but certainly uh, will help you get a little bit more understanding of, of how to deal with these things when they happen. Um, the first thing I want I would like to recommend is and, and you're, because you're listening to this episode, it's a very good start, but please do not let your, your learning stop here. 
think about taking a, a first aid class. Think about taking a CPR class. These won't teach you everything, but it's it's better to have more knowledge than less. Um, the more you learn from people that, that are knowledgeable, the better off you are going to be. But never consider yourself an expert and run around telling people uh, what how they should be doing things. Offer your help when necessary, but and, and advise them. I shouldn't say advise them, like tell them what to do, but offer them assistance if they are not experienced. Um, but definitely find people that know a great deal and, and try to get to that. Um, and, and being an athlete uh, is one of those things where injuries will happen to you. You will get banged up. You will get strains, sprains, all kinds of different things happening. It's imagine your, your body is kind of like a, a race car. Any any race car needs a chief mechanic. You need to have work done on on the machine if it's going to operate properly. And that means uh, finding somebody like Attila who can help you with the structure of your body when it gets warm. It will wear out quicker than it will if you're just sitting, you know, watching television. Um, be ready for that. And don't just think, ah, I'm just going to blow it off. I'll, I'll just heal, let it heal for a week and, and off I go. You're, you're asking for some chronic problems if, if you neglect your machine. Um, also within this introduction, I'd like to say when something does happen, please beyond anything, keep a cool head. Panic does not help any situation at all. Being hysterical does not help anything at all. Um, if something untoward does happen, keep a cool head, find somebody who has got experience that can, that can solve the problem. But all panic does is make whatever happens 10 times worse. Um, so with that out of the way, I, I'd like to get started with uh, some of the subjects that we have tonight. And I've broken these down into, into some categories, although there's some, th some of these topics that kind of can be in different categories. And the three main ones are, and we'll start with this one, is impact injuries. And that is things that happen from being hit too hard or, or ha like what your opponent could possibly do to you. Um, the second category is going to be more internal injuries, such as you step in a hole and you, you sprain your ankle or you twist your knee, something that was not caused by the fighting itself, but is very common anyway. And the last category we want to cover is probably one of the most common, and that is heat related injuries um, or heat related problems, I should say. And we'll cover that one in, in pretty good depth. And we'll kind of let Attila run, run wild with that one because he's uh, dehydration and, and proper hydration is, a, is the main thing for him. So, um, Let's talk about the first one we always think of when we think of injuries, which is impact injuries. Um, and that can be, you know, bruises. It can be cuts or contusions. Um, and let's maybe cover those first. Uh, who'd like to get started? Attila, maybe you should start with this one. Sure. Uh, injuries, uh, when you're sitting there on the field and you get hit. Mm -hmm. uh, if at any point in time, well, let's say you're popping off your armor later on and you're looking down and you're going, wow, I got a bruise. A bruise is a contusion. Uh, it is a damage to the neuro uh, the, to the vascular system. Can also be neurovascular, but this specifically the contusion. That purple that you see is deoxygenation deoxygenated blood that's been that's come out of the blood vessels because those blood vessels have been ruptured. So that's that's an issue. Uh, if that happens a lot, that can be the equivalent of like a microtrauma. You're going to bust though. You're going to have problems with those blood vessels, and you're going to set yourself up for other problems later on. If you keep getting bruised in the same spot, up your armor, because clearly it's not enough. Uh, some of the other things that we need to be careful of. Uh, what did we have next after bruises? Impact cuts and contusions. Yeah, I should have uh, put cuts. lacerations instead of contusions. That was the wrong word. No, know. that's fine. Uh, a laceration is just a technical term for a very jagged cut, uh, as opposed to an incision, which is where you're getting a straight line cut with some form of blade. So uh, you can get a laceration a number of ways. Let's say you're walking through. You don't see that there's a wire somewhere. You you're, pull your leg across it, and it lacerates you. It's just an uneven cut. Uh, some of the other things you can get, and I've had this happen to me, is a pressure cut where uh, I had somebody run full tilt at Penzik, hit me in the head, and knock my helmet so hard. And I've got an arm A 
and it's heavy. It should not have ever had this happen. And I went flying back about eight feet. It it pushed against me, and there was nothing else for it to do. So it actually then pushed up, and the skin would not yield anymore. So it ripped, and that's called a pressure cut. Those are less common than some of the other cuts you can get. Uh, any of the facial cuts will bleed more. Uh, it's very thin, so it's not normally uh, as much of, of something to worry about other than increased blood flow. And for a lot of people, they'll freak out if they have scars. So you want to deal with that very quickly. Uh, anytime you're bleeding, that must be dealt with immediately. Get that person off the field. If it's not being able to be stopped in a very quick manner, that has to be dealt with by professionals immediately. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I don't know, it, different places are doing different levels of what kind of kits they're having around for such things. Uh, but at the very least, get something clean on there. Sterile is awfully nice. Um, and then keep it wrapped on there until you can get to somebody who is at a higher level. Elevation works, cool works, get it above the heart for any of those cuts. Uh, same thing with bruises. It'll actually drain a little faster through the either the venous system or the lymphatic system. Um, but just be careful. You, you're, you're going to get bruised. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, somebody's going to hit you too hard. You're going to fall into something. It, it, it just happens. Bruises happen, but it is damage. And somebody says, oh, it's just a bruise. That's not the way to look at that. It is an injury. And until that bruise goes away, if you get hit there again, and the number of people that have been hit in a bruise, you know, how'd that feel? <laughs> Probably pretty bad. Uh, we have a question on bruising. Uh, yeah. So at what point, I mean, let's be real in the SCA having, getting bruises is pretty much considered a point of pride and we have everything from the little, uh, tiny pinpoint to armor kisses to, um, to a full on like bruise that covers an entire limb. At what point should we really be getting concerned about that, especially if it's happening repeatedly? Besides just like, you know, you learning that you have a hole in your guard and I should start guarding that. Again, if you're if if you've been bruised in the same spot more than twice, mm -hmm. get more better armor. Because okay. you're clearly that individual is not that spot is is being traumatized. I mean, it literally is trauma. And if that happens too often, you can have uh, underlying conditions that can start getting worse. I'm not going to go into the, the myriad of that that can occur. But a bruise is an injury. It needs to be treated as an injury. It needs to be recovered from. If you get that hit again, you've now either, well, you're going to stop healing at that point, and it's going to retrograde to a, a worse condition. But if you keep hitting that same spot, there's... Uh, I will hit one and we don't see this in our thing you see it in football it's called myositis ossificans where somebody and it happens on the thighs a lot uh if you keep getting hit in the same spot the body goes i don't have enough defenses it starts taking calcium and putting it into the muscles because then it's like now we're going to be safe well imagine putting calcium into your muscles bony plates imagine how that's going to degrade the efficiency of the muscle to actually be able to do its thing uh, and then, uh, great addition, uh, with uh, anytime we get a big hematoma, or not a hematoma, sorry, but a, a contusion, that blood is stagnant. That stagnant blood wants to come together in, in little balls. That's coagulation. If that then gets back into general circulation, we call that a blood clot. And we all know the blood clots are not good for us. So... Mm -hmm. If you get big bruises, if you get any kind of bruises, what's going wrong? Are you not blocking? Was it a one-off? Is it a repetitive problem? Oh, that's, I just get bruised there all the time. You need more armor. You need more armor. You need more armor. Fix it. Fix the problem. Don't let it happen again. Don't, they are not war wounds that you should be excited about. They are a problem. So that's contusions. Uh, cuts, cuts happen. Um, if you're getting cut up by your armor, fix it i mean is it plastic and it's just sharp on the edge round it off it's easy take a file if it's metal and it's cutting into it is it rounded can you pat it what's going on there fix it anytime something is hurting you make it stop because it's hurting you and repetitive stress is a real thing so that 
covering any of the lacerations, incisions, <clears throat> anything like that for any of the cuts. Uh, but if something's hurting you, make it stop. Don't don't keep getting hurt. What else do we have here on on the? Uh, I had one question Sorry. about bruising, and this is something that I saw someone do many years ago, um, and that is they actually massaged out the bruise, uh, which, as I've understood, and when I tried it, it was extraordinarily painful. Uh, and I just said, you know, I'd, I'd rather just have the bruise than try to massage this thing out because this is this is rough. But from what I, they, the person who did this told me that by doing that, you you, you break up that coagulation and it actually helps the bruise heal quicker. Um, is that true? If you know what you're doing, if you elevate your the appendage that is damaged, so let's say it's my arm, let's say it's my forearm. For some reason, my armor failed completely. Somebody hit me here and I've got a big old bruise. So I can elevate it above my heart. For one, it is now using gravity to get it back down into my chest and back into, I won't go talking about all the entire vascular system, but it through the venous system and the lymphatic system, you're gonna drain that area and get it back into regular circulation, which will help the bruise. You always wanna bring it back to the heart, but if it hurts, don't do it. Because that means you're in a condition where your body's saying, please leave me alone. I need to heal. So it's something that people can experiment with. I'm, I'm not making a recommendation for or against. I know how to do it. I do it on myself regularly. I have rather advanced training and decades of practice on myself and on others. It can be beneficial, but anytime, even a very light, if it's not going to hurt, literally imagine having a nickel sitting on your skin and that's the weight you're pulling it's not something where you're digging in hard it's barely anything and again this is not recommended learn more get proper training and then see if that can help you sure and hydrate <laughs> elizabeth do you have a comment yeah i just want to say when it comes to bruises uh when we're talking about making them go away one of the things i do is i'm in the gym a lot and on the elliptical a lot and flushing my own body out you know on the elliptical getting the blood flowing getting it moving through my body so if we're looking from a cosmetic point of view to to make the bruise go away we go oh heck i i don't want to have a big bruise on my arm uh that is one way of making it go away and it's your body's way of helping it just flushing it through making the blood move quickly so that's an alternative because if it hurts, I don't want to massage it. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a good point. It, and I, at some point, I wanted to bring this up, and I think now makes is probably as good a time as any. And that is uh, one of the common things that fighters will do is they'll go after good old vitamin I, uh, Advil, um, as an answer to not only bruising, but what we're going to talk about a little later with with all kinds of tears and and strains and, and things like that. Um, I know somebody personally who, because of chronic overuse of ibuprofen, had liver damage enough yeah. combined with uh, some of the recreational beverages, um, wound up going into severe liver, liver failure, and it was fatal. Um, this is, and it's now become ad admitted in recent years uh, that, that Take, relying on ibuprofen, taking it too much can lead to some li liver problems. Uh, and as I understand it, there's some even more recent things with uh, things like acetaminophen, some of the other painkillers uh, that they cause other uh, internal stresses on, on the organs. Um, so be careful about just gobbling up painkillers, thinking that you're going to get a short term fix and my personal recommendation would be try to use that prevention thing. And I think what Attila says about making sure you're armored, uh, trying to take care of your body a little better than, than just letting it get all beat up and then, um, you know, gobbling up painkillers as the solution, I think is uh, not advised. <laughs> um, so like be, be careful. To that, Tris. Pardon? I'd like to add something to that. I know some fighters before they'll go into a tournament or maybe a war or just in the general course of events because you know they're in pain will take um perhaps some painkillers prior to going into fighting mm -hmm. and i again 
uh, I'm going to go with, I think that's kind of goofy. Uh, if we're talking about things like aspirin, it's blood thinner. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't suspect that, you know, in a sport where we get bruised easily, we want to be doing something that would encourage us to bruise. Absolutely. Uh, I myself was on blood thinners for a while, uh, had to go, didn't have to go. Let me rephrase. I went to practice in addition to bruising easily. So I stopped. Uh, I found I had a hard time. It was just everything was really hard. Uh, it made the blood thinners I was on and they were more than just your aspirins. They were pretty heavy duty. They, mm -hmm. they made everything difficult. They made it harder for me to focus and to breathe. Right. So it's just I would recommend don't be like me. I'm a really good, bad example. So don't be best. Don't be a bonehead like me. And don't sit there and say, I think I'm going to take some painkillers uh, or blood thinners before I go in. The other thing, of course, is if you're taking anything that uh, prevents you from feeling the pain, you may not feel it in a timely fashion. And you want to feel pain in a timely fashion. I mean, mostly we don't want to feel pain at all. But if you're going to be injured, you want to know about it. So you can know that you need to stop whatever the heck it is you're doing. And I'm just going to derail this for one second because, you know, that's the way of my people, the boneheads. Um, for unbelted fighters in particular, I know a lot of times you guys think that, because I thought this, so I'm going to assume you did too, that if I stop fighting or if I step back or if I need to take some time to recover, the people are going to look down on me. They're going to think that I'm a wuss, that, I, that I'm that i going to be backwards in time, that I haven't had, you know, I'm losing all this time from practice, and I'm, I'm not fighting in the big tournaments. But uh, frankly, I would be happier to see somebody who is cognizant of uh, their injuries and not come out too quickly or too early, and frankly, re-injure themselves. Uh, last August, the day... <laughs> Literally the day after Eldemir was allowed to fight, I was at a fight practice and tore my bicep off my arm. God damn it. Uh, so I had surgery to reattach it. And for six months, I, you know, the first two months I walked around like this 24 seven and then was in physiotherapist with my physiotherapist. And finally I got some brains and it was, you know, like, okay, when can I go back? And I listened to them when she said to me, don't do this. And I explained what the fighting was. Uh, the reason being is that I could have torn if it wasn't fully healed and soft tissue injuries take a long time. They take longer than you think they do. Um, I could have torn it off again. And, and you don't want to do that. You don't want that with a sprain. We'll go into that. But sprain, strain, soft tissue ish injuries. You don't want that. You don't want to re-injure it and take yourself out for even longer. So don't do that. Sorry, that was my little derailing things. Back Very good. You. And Attila has a point he'd like to raise. Yeah, uh, two things real quickly with uh, uh, ibuprofen. Uh, I had a friend of mine who did collegiate fencing, joined the SCA, was very successful. Uh, but to be able to fight, he would take uh, 1,000 milligrams of ibuprofen before and after fighting. And if you do the conversion on that, 1,000 milligrams is a gram. He was literally taking a gram of ibuprofen and a, a before fighting and a gram of ibuprofen after fighting just to be able to fight. At what point in time do you decide this is going to be a problem for me and then you should stop? And then going back uh, to what Bess was saying, uh, if, if you have an injury, it's okay to step down for a short period of time, get back to 100%. I kept having a reoccurring wrist injury every time I would fight my night somehow we still couldn't figure out after years later he'd hit me in the wrist we still don't know how but he would hit me in the wrist and i would get back to 80 percent and go okay i can start fighting again and that's not the way get back to fully healed or else you're not fully healed i mean it, it sounds so simple but it's so hard to listen to and it was hard for me to get to that point and once i did my fighting increased and shortly afterwards i was knighted because I was healed and I was actually able to fight at full potential as opposed to partial. So that's all I have on that. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, recovery is something we can we often get anxious about and want to want to speed through, but it pays to to not try to speed through it. Um, one one thing I wanted to cover with impact injuries, although this can be structural as well, and that is, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about nerve damage. 
Uh, I had ex personal experience with this, uh, and I've seen a number of people also experience it, both SCA fighters and, and people in, in other fields, um, where it's one of those things that happens that you don't even necessarily know that it happens at the time. Uh, whereas a bruise, you usually know, okay, I got hit and I know I got bruised. Um, same thing with cuts, but nerve damage can be rather subtle. It can be feel like a, a pinch, um, or even you won't even feel it at all. Some people get nerve damage from sleeping the wrong way and their neck kind of gets twisted a little bit or, or, or whatnot. And they wake up and they, they feel like a couple fingers are numb or they feel numbness along some part of their body, usually leg or, or arm. Um, in my case, I, I suddenly had like, I didn't have enough strength to lift uh, like a can of water, just no strength in my arm from the shoulder. And uh, eventually it, it, I recovered from that. It, it, I got the strength back, but um, it was disconcerting. What I found along the way, at least what I was told by the experts were, was that nerves can, can heal. There, can, there is nerve damage that, that sometimes never heals, but, but quite often it does heal, but it takes rid, a ridiculously long amount of time. Um, it, in my case, it took almost five months before I could, I had enough strength in that arm to, to do anything useful with it. Um, it was very disconcerting because just suddenly I had no strength in it and I had no idea what, what had happened that caused that nerve damage. Um, in fact, I, I suspect what it was, and it, it took probably two months for the, the damage from what I think happened until my body was noticeably uh, hindered from what it normally, how it normally operated. Um, nerve damage can, can make, can you, and I'm sure everybody has felt this when they, when they bang a nerve and they feel that zing, go, go zinging down a limb or, or zinging up to a shoulder. Um, so you can, you can spot that. And sometimes it goes right away. There's no, there's no lasting ill effect to your body. But I, the reason I wanted to bring this up is if anybody is, has experienced what I have and suddenly something is not right, you, you know, it's, it's not either you're not, you got numbness, you feel that zinging or tingling, uh, things like that. Um, realize that it could very well be nerve, uh, nerve damage. And that don't be surprised if it takes a while to heal. And we're going to say this repeatedly, go find somebody that is very experienced that can help you figure out what happened and what it is, and perhaps can help you try to heal it. Um, and don't be impatient. Don't think that if you do have some nerve damage, it's going to be a quick, uh, you know, week or two, and then you're back, back to normal. Um, just something to be aware of. It was, it took me totally by surprise that when it happened, I had never been exposed to the concept of nerve damage. Uh, so it was, it was quite disconcerting. Um, okay. Let me look over some of the comments. Uh, and there are quite a few comments kind of hard for me to keep up with, but, um, yeah, uh, Duke Paul, uh, notices ibuprofen is very bad for the liver. I think more information has come out in the last 10 years than we knew about previously. Uh, and I think people uh, who feel that they can go buy something over the counter that it's safe to do to just use however they want is uh, that's that's usually not not a great uh, not a great pers perspective to have on it. Um, I couple, like to, uh, sorry, Tris, I just want to add a couple of things sure, to what, sure. what you said about soft tissue injuries. So a lot of the time you, you might see yourself, you know, oh, I got a soft tissue injury and you look at your favorite, I don't know, baseball player or boxer and they, you know, they're on the disabled list and they come back in in two weeks and like, well, if they can heal in two weeks, so can I. They have a whole team of people helping them. They have a limited lifespan. So they're taking shots like cortisol shots or steroid shots. They've got physiotherapists. They've got massage therapists. They've got people, trainers who know what they're doing. You know what we have? We got us. If you're lucky, you know, you might have a friend like Attila who can help you out, but we are not them. We don't have a team behind us. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that, you know, some baseball pitcher, clearly I'm not a big baseball fan, um, comes back from a rotator cuff injury and they're back in, you know, X number of weeks or months, that is not the reality of it for those of us who are not being paid millions of dollars a year 
and are being paid to do this thing. So I think that's really important that, that we keep that in mind while we're talking about these things. Sure. Attila, you had a thought. A uh, bunch. Uh, so dovetailing off of Bess, uh, so the the teams that surround pro professional sports individuals are very extensive, and it's not just the individuals that are there, it's also the equipment and what they have access to. Yeah, even when I was an athletic trainer, the just having a, a, a simple training room allows me to get somebody back up to full or a, a quicker recovery just by what I've got that I can do on which modalities that I have. Can I use heat? Can I use cold? Is there a, a stim? So there's a lot of different things that, that can assist with the recovery of that individual. Then getting back to the topic, the, the, some of the talks, the topics on neural injuries that you had mentioned about, Tris. Uh, and then we can also kind of dovetail some of the cuts and contusions into neurals also. Mm -hmm. If you get a cut, you can cut through, through a nerve and suddenly the area that that nerve was responsible for you don't feel anything there anymore it doesn't mean that everything's fine it literally means that you don't feel anything from that nerve anymore uh nerves by definition are designed to be super sensitive that's why when tris was saying that you know, like the funny bone right you got a nerve that passes through here you can hit it and you're like oh god and it goes away quickly that's the best part of it it can go quickly unless it's something worse if you have uh, paresthesia, if you have uh, issues with hot or cold, your sensitivities are different, something just doesn't feel right, seek professional care. Go to your doctor. Go If you think it's bad enough and you're really worried, go to an urgent care. Go by your gut. If you, do, if you think something's wrong, get it fixed. Get it seen. Um, and then contusions. So pressure Again, nerves are very sensitive. So pressure on a nerve, inside or out, can uh, make that nerve fire, and it can make it fire and do its normal job, or make it seem odd for that paresthesia, different altered sensation. Um, a contusion, you've got swelling. That swelling can push inwards on those nerves, and that nerve can, so let's say again, here's my, my bruise. Here's my bruise. If it's, there we go. If I have nerves running through here and I feel weird up, up farther along from that position, this pressure here from this swelling that's in my contusion could be pressing on the nerves and making you feel weird here. Either scenario, you still have something feeling weird here. If you don't know why, get it checked. You're not a doctor unless you're a doctor and then you're just probably not watching the show. So if in doubt, get it checked out. Mm -hmm. That's it. Excellent. Um, and I wanted to add one more thing too. When you watch the sports players, realizing these are young people, generally, almost always they're younger people and they've been athletes all their life. Their body is in a constant state of being rebuilt um through through superior conditioning usually superior nutrition um everything they've got a pro athlete is like a whole different type of a body and so you can't you yet another reason you can't just say well they can do it i can do it because you know they did it uh, not only do they have all the support but their body is used to being rebuilt constantly through almost endless conditioning um which helps uh, one of the things about about injury that 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 I definitely feel, and, and that is, movement is medicine. If you get injured and you just lay down and lay down for a couple of months, that's probably going to be one of the worst things that you can do. I mean, unless you're in traction and you cannot move or something severe, but the idea that you just go dormant because you feel discomfort or you feel a bit of pain. Um, now you, you will probably need some help in how to use movement effectively and properly in order to, to help your body recover. Uh, that will probably be the case, just like those athletes that get help. They have expert rehab people, they have expert trainers and whatnot that can help them with their stretching, their mobility, all of these things. But um, it, it's, it is, you need to learn about that if you have that injury and you may have to manage how you do it. You may have to find the experts. You may have to find the right people 
that can help you because there are uh, just like auto mechanics or any other profession there are quacks and incompetent people and there are good solid people that know what they're doing and so uh with that i'll, I'll hand you off to attila again uh dovetailing into what you were talking about with uh high level athletes they again a short period of time they're not having 40 year careers and they are race cars they're highly tuned mm -hmm. they have a team that is then going to take care of any problems that they have and get them back on the track we're anywhere from nice new cars all the way to old clunkers <laughs> you decide where you are on that spectrum would you like a paint job that's not going to do it you have to do the stuff on the inside do you want a new engine? Fix it. <laughs> if you are, <laughs> pass. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you need to do something, then take the time to do it, but do it right. Do your research beforehand and make sure you're making the correct adjustments. Sports specific activities. If you're going to fight with a sword and shield, practice with a sword and shield. If you want to do glaive, practice with the glaive. If you're fencing, which form and then do that because your body will remodel itself based on the specific actions that you are causing with it and again if you're hurt take some time off if you're not have a blast but be smart and drink lots of water <laughs> sorry uh, we were going to come to that hydration one here shortly <laughs> all right Bess, you had a point yep so building on talking about pain when you when you fight you're a fighter you're a fencer you do combat archery in our sport i won't say pain is an old friend but it's an old companion we are used to feeling a lot of pain we're used to things aching us or causing us some discomfort so you need to be aware of when you're hurt and like actually injured or or when something goes beyond what we're accustomed to and You'll notice I say accustomed to, but one of the things that we we talk about or that we are like is I'm going to sign the bruise or, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I was so hurt. You know, man, I hit that squire so hard his knight felt it. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. Don't do that. Um, hurt and pain is a signal from your body that something is wrong. So you need to pay attention to it, even though it's an old companion. Focus on what uh, your body is telling you. Focus on what your pain is telling you. Um, is it something new? Is it something different? You, you really need to focus on on you. There you go. Uh, and then uh, speaking a little bit more about that, one of the things that we do as, as fighters, especially older fighters, I got hit, something hurts a little bit, I get used to it, eh, no big deal. Then you can actually normalize that level of pain and you're so used to it that that's it. I just live at that level. Instead of getting it healed, having that pain go away, it's now a chronic condition. Well, if you get injured a little bit more, now you, you're you used to it here, but if it's a little bit more, well, then you're just like, oh, it only hurts a little bit more. So you've normalized a certain level of pain. Now you're experiencing more. Well, if that pain becomes the, the normal level again, you've now normalized a higher level of pain. You have to be very, very careful of that. So get to zero, get to where you're pain-free. And if it's a surprise when you get there, that means you were in a chronic condition for a very long time. Try never to get there. That's a very bad place for your body to live. Done. Yeah, and uh, you guys keep saying older fighters, but really the reason my knee clicks when I walk up the stairs is because of I was using bad form when I was 17 and 18. It's even if it's not showing up, because I never had knee pain at the time, even if it's not showing up, you're still potentially doing damage and that you're going to feel later on. And like, it's a known thing. I'm going to have to get a knee replacement sometime in the next 10 years. And yeah, that's, it, it's not just a sin of people over 30. <laughs> That's true. Um, I want to wrap up the the impact injuries with uh, two points, one of which is a small one. Uh, and then we're going to get on to the king of them, which is dealing with concussions and and um, and brain brain issues uh, related to impact. Um, and that the first one is uh, the dislocated rib. And I've had these I've, I've known a number of different people that have had them. I've had it repeatedly. Uh, 
both with SCA fighting and with the martial arts that I do. Um, it's one of those things that can feel like a heart attack because when a rib dislocates, it can actually put pressure. Uh, it, 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 it can be a very acute pain, almost like you've got a dagger dri driving through either the front or the back or both. Um, and oftentimes because of where the dislocates, you'll feel the, the pain offset a little bit. It won't be in the center of the chest and it'll feel like a heart attack. Um, when you breathe, it'll be a sharp pain. Uh, when you try to expand your chest and, and breathe. I, I have a, know somebody personally who felt they were having a heart attack and they went immediately to the ER and got all kinds of tests. And they said, your heart is absolutely fine. We don't know what this is. Um, they didn't even find or notice the dislocated rib. And, and when I talked to him, I asked him, you know, said, what, you know, what were you doing the, 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 before this happened or the day before? And he said, well, nothing really. And I said, well, you weren't doing anything strenuous. Well, you know, I moved a roll of carpet. I lifted it over my shoulder. And he's like, you know what? I think I probably did this. Okay. My rib, but I mean, it, it can be scary when it happens. Um, and that's not to discount the idea that if you have chest pain, you could be having a heart attack, but, um, realize that if you did something very strenuous and with the impacts that we take with things like spear shots, uh, pole arm thrusts, uh, the impact of running into somebody with a shield, all of these things can impact you uh, in the in the rib cage, or if even if you just fall on the ground, um, you know, in the training we do in Aikido, this is something if you don't get used to to falling on the ground safely, you can fall and get a dislocated rib. And and I'll tell you that it it doesn't sound that painful just hearing oh it's you know dislocated a little bit. I will guarantee you it can be extraordinarily painful. Um, and a good therapist can reset it, can put it back where it should be. Uh, you can often wait it out. Uh, it will s sometimes reset by itself, uh, but it's just something to be aware of that don't automatically think necessarily, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack. Um, it could be something very simple and very impact related. Um, uh, with that, I think I would like to cover something that has been kind of a personal uh, quest for me, which is to find out about concussions and to let everybody know when I was Earl Marshall, uh, during my tenure, I had two injury incidents that were quite severe and dealt with, um, that were concussion related. In one case, uh, a young lady didn't realize that she had a brain tumor and she got struck at a practice normal level of a shot. And she went into a seizure. Uh, they got her to the ER immediately. She wound up being okay. They did a brain scan and found this this uh, this brain tumor. And it was, about, I guess, it was about the size of a golf ball. And the doctor said, this is amazing. Actually, this is the luckiest thing you could ever have happen because we've never, you never probably would have found this any other way. Um, and of course, everybody acted exactly properly. They got her to the hospital immediately, um, you know, called an ambulance, the whole thing. So everything turned out for the, for the better, but it's one of those things that these can happen. And that's that's kind of the extreme story and pretty easy to actually figure out if somebody's on the ground twitching you call 911 immediately get a, get an ambulance don't don't mess around the part that's trickier and this is something that that researching this and finding out from experts including uh you know the physician that that treated her is as well as other physicians that are experienced with this Concussions, especially very mild ones, can be extremely difficult to spot, even for experts. Because, uh, you know, when this happened, I, I really wanted to, as Earl Marshall, take on, all right, how do we educate our marshals? How do we educate our fighters of what to look for in terms of symptoms of mild concussions? And this was at a period of time when there was uh, some fairly new studies and reports and articles out about repeated impact syndrome, I think is what they called it. And this was happening with primarily high school and young football players who were playing hard. They would get a, the initial, an initial mild concussion. It, the, the symptoms were so mild or there, weren't, very, there were, weren't really any symptoms. They'd go continue playing and they'd have repeated impacts where the brain had, from the first impact, had started to swell a little bit. Then they got a second impact and it swelled and it proved to be fatal. Um, so unfortunately, I did not find that there was any clear protocol what uh, to, to be looking for. There are some things that you can, you can look for 
that are fairly obvious when somebody really gets their chimes rung when they are um, they have a, a an attention problem they have a they, they have a hard time remembering uh, what just happened maybe they ask you the same question repeatedly because they forgot that they've asked you that that question or they make the same statement over and over again uh, confusion um, there, there's a number of other fairly obvious uh, symptoms but what what this investigation for me came home with was do not take concussions or getting your bell rung lightly don't think that just because you got shaken a little bit you're okay just to go run out and go keep going um it, it can be very dangerous and yes of course it's up to up to you the person uh, you know you're you're the first and foremost uh responsible for your own well-being um but be very careful with with brain type things and this can be either from you know taking a hard shot it can be from running into a tree in a in a woods battle it can be tripping over and landing on your head or or having your head whip into the ground uh the a helmet doesn't doesn't necessarily guard against gravity and your impact with the ground so there's a lot of different ways that you can get your bell rung without necessarily being hit by hit by some duke with a with a two by four um but be very my, my advice to you is is be very careful of it not only of yourself but also trust your fellow fighters that when they tell you hey you're not quite all there maybe you need to sit down and and uh and and take it easy for a while trust them when they do when they do that and you might realize you as a fighter might have to do that for one of your fellow fighters if you see that they have some confusion maybe some balance issues where they don't normally have that um, there, re there can be quite a few uh, of these symptoms that are very, very mild, but I just hate to see anybody through uh, wanting to just go and tough it out that they feel that they need to go fight for their king or they need to fight in this champion's battle. They've gotten their bell rung and they just want to, you know, say, okay, I, I can be, I can be tough and, and keep going. Um, brain, the brain stuff. And this is all the doctors that I had talked to. All the articles that I'd read, everything that I had found pretty much says the same thing. There's a ton that we do not know about the brain and how it does what it does. And it's very, very hard for these mild, mild cases of concussions to be spotted. Um, but if you if you don't take care with them, it can be very, very dangerous. So I just wanted to I wanted to bring that up and and uh does anybody have a comment they'd like to add in on, on that? I do. Sure. Um, so I think this applies to pretty much everything that we're going to be talking about today of normalize both for yourself and for other people. Take If you have any sort of an injury, even if it's something as stupid as your fingernail getting bent back, we don't, especially right when something happens, we're really bad at gauging the full scale of the situation. And it's like normalized going, anytime you go, ow, just go, you know what, I'm gonna take a break. And so, cause some, even if it's something minor, like the fingernail thing, um, that can cause a huge adrenaline rush that could cause you to suddenly start hitting really hard and potentially cause damage to someone else. I had an incident where I got my Lips dis or my ribs dislocated on the field, and you know, and it was in a bear pit. And my first thought was, you know, I'm going to march on and get back in line for the bear pit. And it took me through the entire line to go, something is really wrong. And you know, and in the moment, I was like, wow, that, that was a really hard hit. And you know, fortunately, I had the time to stop and have to think about it. But if it had, if it had been just a tournament or pickup fights or gosh, a melee, I would have just kept on at it. And God knows how much that would have uh, further damaged me. Yes. So there are some things that you can do uh, to help mitigate, you know, so I didn't say totally eliminate, but mitigate uh, concussion risk. So on a regular basis, inspect the padding in your helm. Uh, I think a lot of people forget to do that and you really need to do that. Uh, padding, like everything else, deteriorates and uh, can, it can be replaced, but your brain cannot. 
there's anti-concussion padding that's available on the market. So you may want to take a look at some anti-concussion padding. Suspension harnesses for your head is also another way. It's a period solution to a period problem. So you might want to see if you can work in some uh, suspension harnesses for you um, for, for your uh, head. The other thing is an odd thing that I actually, I learned, uh, and I have a hard time believing it, but I follow it. I have heard that you can get concussions uh, from an unusual place, which is your lower jaw slamming into your upper jaw. Um, and so a mouth guard uh, can help alleviate that. It wouldn't be necessarily the mouth guards that you would get, you know, you boil it up, you shape it to your mouth. Uh, my mouth guard was made for me by my dentist. And uh, in case you're wondering, red is my favorite color, but they won't make a mouth guard in red, which made sense when I realized, you know, okay, you, you don't want to look like you're bleeding from your mouth. Yep. Uh, but you can get really cool colors if you want. Uh, so there are things that you can do to mitigate the loss. And I would encourage everybody to take a look at, uh, look at uh, padding. You can, there's a lot of sites. If you just Google anti-concussion padding, there are many sites. Uh, so give it a go um, and consider a mouth guard. It, it actually works. There have been a number of studies on mouth guards in specific uh, in uh, rugby, Australian rules rugby. Uh, there's a lot of impacts of going forward or upwards. And the uh, it also can cause a huge amount of problems, uh, TMJ and such, with the temporal mandibular joint, your actual your jaw joint. But uh, it was interesting in Australia, every single individual who got a concussion then started wearing a mouth, mouth guard. The, a concussion is caused in most situations, unless it's a specific contra coup type of injury, which we can not worry about, uh, by an impact. That impact is then transmitted through the skull into the brain itself in some fashion. If you like any kind of explosive force, if you can take that moment of impact, the time period of over over which that energy is released, and if you can increase that, the force decreases. So the mouth guard, that small, tiny piece of rubber in between the teeth, when you get hit underneath your jaw, then slows this, the time period over which that release goes to the brain, and it can actually make it so you're not getting a concussion may not stop all of the damage but it can be assistive and you want those properly fitted because if they're not done properly and if they're too small you can swallow them so let's not swallow our mouthpieces please get them professionally done if you're going to get one get one that's correctly fitted properly done and that's going to be of a material that's going to last for an extensive period of time because they they do wear down over time what else excellent did, did we want to do the pain uh, no pain no gain do we want to talk about yeah that? And, uh, let's let's lead that in with the structural injuries um obviously we could put the put that uh anywhere yeah, we wanted to but i think here we're going to talk about the things that happen to you not just from your opponent hitting you or you hitting the ground but uh things like strained knees twisted knees uh sprained ankles uh muscle tears um all the cramps and charley horses all the stuff that that happens just to you as you're doing your thing and this could happen to any runner any tennis player uh, not ne not necessarily let the, the impact but here's where a lot of times uh we get to the and, and a viewer comment uh, brought this up uh, a number of a number a couple of viewers did talking about the old phrases no pain no gain which is i think was taken from a uh, like bodybuilding, weight, weightlifting type of a realm where they talked about you have to work out until you're sore and you're you're hurting in order for you to actually make any progress. Well, that has been completely debunked. Um, from even from that realm, they understand that that just doesn't work. But it's something that I think most martial artists and tough guys seem to have picked up and ran with like crazy. That uh, uh, as well as phrases like pain is just weakness leaving your body which really is just nothing but a joke. Uh, it's a funny one, but it doesn't mean that it is a, a good mantra for your, your training. Uh, and then the other one, that that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I think that's a Nietzsche, if I remember right, uh, saying. Um, I think that was meant as a, as a 
phrase to kind of boost your morale when you're getting your ass kicked, uh, <laughs> to, to give you some motivation to get up and keep going. Um, but these are not sound uh, theories or approaches for dealing with injuries and how and how to overcome them. And to me, it's it's play smarter, not harder. And phrases like like we just mentioned tend to be just go hard, go fast, pound, 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 and keep going. Which, if you you're maybe overcoming a bit of discomfort, that's one thing. But if you realize that you have real pain, which is an indication of actual injury, be smarter than that. Don't don't push your body to the point where it needs help, it needs to recover, and you're not letting it. You're not seeing to it. You're not uh, dealing with it properly. Um, so I guess that's that's uh, my two cents on it. Uh, Beth, did you have one you wanted to toss in there? I do, but they're Canadian two cents, so it's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll deal with the exchange rate. <laughs> so one of the things that along with these is you don't quit, you keep going. You know what? That's malarkey. Sorry, I had to use tough language, but... You know, I'm, I'm not going to hold back. That's malarkey. If you are feeling awful, it's okay to stop. In fact, I would encourage you to do so. It's okay to say, you know what? I've had enough. Uh, that's a big, I'm a gym rat and that's a big thing in the gym. You know, people will walk in and they'll say, yeah, you know, I worked out. It was so hard. And they'll go, yeah, but did you die? Well, you don't want to do that. Uh, it's the same with the no pain, no gain. It, it, the, the theory is that, you know, you're breaking down your muscles and they have to rebuild and it you're sore it's it causes the soreness but here's the thing you can be strong you can get strong without having muscle soreness uh it takes a little longer but you're not in pain so i think not being in pain is a good thing i don't agree with fighting you know the um pain is weakness leaving the body so i'm going to stay on the field even if i'm barfing in my helm no 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 please please don't barf on the field where you know i can a see you which makes me want to barf too and i might walk in it so don't do that okay it's okay to say i'm gonna step back for a little while so i had to add that mm -hmm. that's a good point um i'm a i'm a big fan of the train smarter not harder and for those people that go out on saturday and they want to go balls to the wall and fight through the pain, I'll usually try to find out, well, what did you do during the week to prepare for this? Did you train every day? Do you do an exercise regimen? Do you stretch? Do you do the preparation things that are smart rather than just going out on Saturday and just pushing your body past the point where it can, it can operate correctly? Um, it would be better to prepare and be smart about it than to just be a kamikaze on the weekends. Um, I've even heard the joke of, you know, during the week you treat your body like a temple and then on the weekends you treat it like an amusement park. Um, you know, it's good that you, you do the preparation things to make your performance go better. Attila, you have a thought. So what are you, then everybody needs to consider what they're doing as preparation. Are you maintaining hydration? I, I drink mm -hmm. a minimum of four liters of water a day. Uh, are you working out regularly? Uh, we have muscle loss within three days of uh, after activity. So are you working out regularly? Are you doing sports specific activity? Are you working out in your armor or without it? it that's a, a, a you kind of decision. But if you just think you're going to be at peak performance by going out on a Saturday and well, I'm, I'm very motivated, so I'll do very well. You're not going to do very well and you're risking injury. If you are ready, if you are hydrated, if you work out in your gear, if you know what you're doing, if you are really taking care of yourself, if you have slept properly on a regular basis, if you are doing all of the things that you know, to be doing and if you don't know learn about it then you're going to be ready on saturday otherwise you're not and if you really want to be ready get an anatomy physiology textbook from a college course you can get them when the kids are going out and leaving the bookstores have a bunch of them they don't have to be the newest 900 dollars textbook but it's an owner's manual for your body if you read it and truly study it 
it tells you about the muscular system, the skeletal system, the nervous system, your skin, and how all of these systems interrelate to allow you to be at full performance. I can guarantee you professional athletes sure know a lot more about their bodies than we do in general. That's why they're professional level athletes, because they're not all the most athletic. They are intelligent people. Sure, a bunch of them are gifted, but not all of them. We have individuals who uh, are, don't have the highest of a, uh, levels of athleticism, but they train and they train properly and they train regularly and they get results. And that's what I had in that. I, well, I'm going to have Nicolina uh, come on to say something next, but I want to jump in with a really great book recommendation. And this is one that we covered uh, on our book recommendation episode uh, last year. And that is it's a book called Building the Supple Leopard. And it is it's, it's a thick textbook, hardcover, and it's built by a martial artist who talks about how to prepare your body, especially an aging body, for dealing with the martial arts. It is an outstanding reference book, and I would highly recommend it for anybody, any athlete, really, who wants to understand their body better and how it relates to martial performance. So check out uh, Building the Supple Leopard. Um, Nicolina, your turn. Yeah, so... There's no way to be able to avoid all injuries. There will be always be this freak circumstance, uh, no matter what we do. But when it comes to structural injuries of the ones we're talking to about today, it's probably the most preventable. And by understanding, like Attila was saying, understanding how your body works, you can eliminate a lot of unnecessary ones, whether it's understanding which way certain joints are supposed to move and fencing community we're like fencing community it's all about that especially your leading knee and because when you throw a lunge you're taking just an absolutely extraordinary amount of force is put into that knee and being able to teaching people from the get-go you know it's a hinge you, it's not a ball joint you, it, it goes like this and that's about all it can do um, you can drastically just uh, decrease the chances of your knee blowing out by and making sure that you're diligent every single time you throw uh, throw a lunge, that you're using your knee properly. And every single joint has, is designed to be moved in different ways, things like that. And by by using the, our body correctly and using different muscle groups, the strong ones instead of the weak ones, you can cut out a whole lot of unnecessary blood, sweat, and tears. Um, I, I'm a little short on time today, so I've got to bounce, but it has been great talking to you guys. Thank you, Nicolina, for coming Thanks, on the show. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, so it. Thank, it's good to have you here for, for the time you did. Thanks. Nice to see you. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Uh, and Attila, you had a thought. Yeah, uh, dovetailing right along, uh, so jumping right into knees. Uh, it's a really unstable joint. Literally, the top of the lower leg, the, the large bone in the lower leg, which is the one in front, uh, the, the uh, tibia, the top of it's called the tibia plateau. If anybody knows geography, they know that that's a flat spot. In the very middle of it, there's a slight crest. The, uh, the femur, which is your thigh bone, comes down and has two knots that roll and between them is where that little crest on the tibial plateau goes it is not a stable joint the only reason it stays together is because we have four ligaments that are which are bone to bone connectors and those ligaments hold it roughly in place but it has to slide as it rolls it's a very complex joint we can have huge amounts of injuries to it as as we all know and one of the other things so nicolina was saying that with a deep lunge you're putting a lot of force on that and you're also putting it in a bent position uh so one you can do multiples of weight as an extra, extrapolation on what's going on at your knee at that point in time running downstairs or moving downstairs can exert three to five times your body weight on a joint when you're doing a full lunge it's very similar due to the rapidity of the motion so take your weight and multiply it by three if you don't like that one Take your weight and multiply it by five. If you don't like that one, train better. Or if you feel that it's appropriate, lose some weight to increase your ability to have a knee that lasts longer. Or you risk blowing out your knee. And that 
is very painful and can happen in a myriad of ways based on either musculoskeletal injury or on ligamentous injury or the articular surface, the, the joint itself can also go. And it's, it's a tough injury to recover from because so many things can go wrong and it's so unstable. Yeah, I think knee injuries are one of the, when we're talking about structural injuries, uh, the most common ones that that we tend to see tend to be knees and I think shoulders, especially for sword fighters. They tend to have uh, shoulder issues, which also then tend to lead to elbow issues. Um, these are the most common ones. And um, we can talk a little bit about avoidance. But of course, with, usually with these, pain is one of those things that, that indicates you have a problem. Um, with knees, one of the things that can happen, and I saw this happen quite recently, is uh, uh, and it's similar to the concussion thing that we talked about, there was a, a mild thing that would happen. The knee would get tweaked and somebody would feel it. They go, ooh, I think something happened to my knee. And they kind of walk it or walk around a little bit and they feel, well, it doesn't, it, I guess it feels pretty normal. I just got a tweak and now I don't feel anything amiss. And then something did happen it is injured, but it's not screaming in pain and telling you go sit down and, and be off of this, but it's unstable, something stretched. And then either they quit their activity and sometime in the next day, later that day, or sometime in the next day or two, then they have a real knee collapse or they keep going. They say, well, I, I'll just walk it off and rub some dirt on it and then I'll go fight and what have you. And then they really do their knee big time. Um, Attila, you wanted to, I'll right. You, I'll start so, out and you run with this one. Yeah. So let's say at whatever joint you're experiencing it, suddenly you have this, oh my God, that really hurt. You're either walking it off or you're moving your shoulder or you're extending your elbow and you can't reproduce that pain. You're not doing the same ballistic level that caused that initial injury. And uh, let me be clear. If you're having that burst of pain, you did have an injury. You had something go on and your body went, please stop. Now you can either listen to that or push through it and risk a worse injury or further injury. So it, it depends. I mean, ultimately, how long do you want to play this game? We're not peasants who are going to be alive for two more days on a battlefield. We're going to fight how many battles in a single day and then do it again and then do it again. And for those who enjoy to imbibe and and party afterwards you're now your body wants to recover and you're ingesting a poison into your system that's why we call it intoxication so your liver is working really hard to try and take care of all of your regular injuries now it has to deal with the toxin so be very careful be gentle on your body if you feel pain something happened if you can't reproduce it it may be because you're not doing something ballistic or strong enough to reproduce that specific injury. Uh, listen to your body. Pain is a warning. Shoulder, knee, ankle, doesn't matter. I don't care if you sprain your or strain your tongue. It's an injury. Listen to your body. So I would like to add a little something about knees. Both uh, Duke Lucan from the East and Duke Bronis from the Mid have a, a philosophy about uh, helping to prevent knee injuries. And one of the things that uh, Duke Lucan does is it's a period sole. It does, so it slides. So that his, his thought and philosophy is that with our modern soles, if say you're on the field and you're wearing cleats and the cleats are digging into the ground, instead of your body moving, sliding, that it's your feet are planted and you're, that might cause your knee to torque in the sideways motion, as we've said, that it's not supposed to do. And I knew, know that uh, Dubronis feels the same way about it. So if we're thinking about knees, uh, one of the things you might want to consider is, is what do your shoes do? Do they grip really hard? Uh, I'm trying something new. I'm going to wrestling shoes, which have a very minimal uh floor grip. I don't know what the exact term is. And while I have no knee injuries now, I would like that to be to continue. Uh, so it's something I'm trying. I'm looking at my equipment. What can I do now? What can I proactively do to prevent some of the common uh, injuries I have not yet had? 
because God knows I've had a heck of a lot of the common ones. So I'm, I'm trying to like narrow them down. So it's something to take into account. Uh, if you're in cleats and you're on the field, perhaps that might cause ankles or knees or I don't know, maybe a hip injury or something along that. So, so give it a go. And with that, you're talking about two extremely experienced individuals who know their kit and know what works for them. If you want to try uh, a less traction-y sole, certainly go for it. Don't try it before a war or a tournament. Walk around with it a couple of weeks. It's like when you get a first pair of uh, backpack boots. You want to wear them in. You They wear into your feet. They are then appropriate for you, and you know how they feel. If you go to some slippery shoe, and you're not ready for that, you are going to have slippery shoes and you are going to slip, which could lead to other injuries. That being said, also, don't go to something that gives you too much traction. If your feet can't move a little bit, that means all of the force generated coming into your body, whether from a hit or from your movements, mm -hmm. is then going to have to go through all those joints. And if you can move, if your feet can wiggle even just a little bit, it's going to reduce the probability of, of most injuries. So uh, have your kit be your kit. When you have armor, it's got to be your armor. Make sure it fits you perfectly. It doesn't pinch. It doesn't bind. It doesn't cut you. It doesn't allow you to get bruised. Uh, footwear, super important. If you have no arches, are you having something in there that's giving you an artificial arch that is going to benefit your biomechanics for movement? Or are you, are you flat-footed and you're very comfortable with that? You know, what do you have going on? Do you have Vibram soles? Do you have what uh, Duclocan is wearing, uh, wearing? So they're a little bit more slippery, so they're more comfortable. Uh, it's uh, for him, and, and that's his fighting style. I, I'd worry about that because I move around a lot. I know he does also. Um, and for me, I, I have to have a bit more traction. So find out what works. It's experimentation. But experiment with one variable. Don't do it out on the field. Put your shoes on. Be in a pair of shorts, in a t-shirt. Go outside, move around. Move around a lot. Replicate actions that you might do. Then pick up your weapon. Start slow and see how that traction, difference in traction is beneficial or negative for you. And then uh, keep it if it works. Don't if it doesn't. But get up to the point where you're, you're, in, you're in those new shoes because shoes are great because it does make a huge difference. Um, I have vibrant soles on mine and they were great for me um, and get to the point where you're practicing with a friend in a controlled environment with the weapons form that you want to do at full speed, no power, and then slowly moving up. So you know exactly how it feels. If it feels weird, what's feeling weird. If you've only entered one variable at a time, you know at what step the new variable and how you can augment that. So maybe the slippery shoes, maybe the grippier shoes. Find out, experiment, play. Who knows? It might be, oh my God, this has now made me 20% better. I'd take that right now. Um, <laughs> and and But have fun, make your kit your own. Good tip. You know, knees are one of the, it is the joint that seems to take the most um, abuse. And we'll talk a little bit about about I, the, the difference between, and I'm sure a lot of listeners want to hear this, the difference between like a, a sprained ankle and a strained ankle. But for now, and this is something that I experienced myself a couple of times, and that is um, what happens when you feel that knee tweak that causes a, a bit of internal swelling. And that is, for me, it felt like the backside of the knee started to feel tight, like it was filling up. And when, you know, you go to bend the knee, it, do, it won't bend all the way because it feels like it's filled up and that internal knee swelling, and we're going to cover this hopefully a little bit with, with recovery is what took the longest time to completely go away. And it went away slowly. And the advice that I was given by professionals was when it goes all the way away, it's not all the way gone yet. It's probably 80% gone. The last 20% will feel completely normal. So you're probably going to go want to go out and go do your thing at 100% because you feel everything is, is back to normal. But once you feel that back to normal, take another two to four weeks at least and consider yourself still injured and recovering. Don't go out and go 100% because it's not 
it's not done yet. Uh, there's still internal swelling in there. And now I've gotten to the point, I'm kind of an expert of feeling whether there's an internal swelling in my knee or not. Um, but it is one of those things that can go along with knee injuries. It's not just the sharp pain on the side, and I've felt that one too. Um, or, you know, a complete collapse of your knee because it, it got twisted in such a way that it's painful and now you're laying on the ground screaming. Um, it's It can go along with hyperextensions or, or, or different things like that. I've just found that knees are fussy. Um, you know, I've experienced firsthand that no, they are not a stable joint. And it's one of the joints that I very much take great care to, uh, to protect because when they go, they can go spectacularly and it can be something that will never get back. No matter how much you're operated on though, it'll never get back to normal. So Attila, you had something you wanted to add to this. Uh, yeah, I should have covered this at the very beginning. So uh, a strain is going to affect, and this is terminology, so your muscles and your tendons are considered to be one unit for injuries. So a strain affects muscles and tendons. You have some form of tear, grades, uh, several grades, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how bad you do it. And then for ligaments, we strain, or excuse me, sprain ligaments. So the common one is you are you twist your ankle and there's some swelling there's some bruising and you have damaged the ligaments you could have also damaged other uh, uh pieces of the puzzle there but in general ankles we do a sprain on but then let's say you you do something to your quads that's going to be a strain as opposed to that sprain for the ligamentous and then also a great point with my injury feels a hundred percent this is great so you've done the healing you've just gotten to the point where your body is no longer actively saying i'm hurting i'm hurting i'm hurting and you're going ah oh, it's gone away i can go back to full practice you can i would recommend against that because at that point in time it's almost there but now you don't have any immediate defense mechanism of you got that little voice in the back of your head saying eh, please be careful so you will go all out but you're still injured you're almost there but if you push too hard you're you're going to re-injure it so give yourself another if it's been an injury that you've been out for for four weeks on give yourself another week you've already been out four weeks by this point in time you could have been working on other parts of your body if it's an arm injury you got another arm you can work out you got legs you can work out you can do walking around you can do a lot of things find your injury isolate it do things with the rest of your body sit-ups oh your arm hurts really can you can you do this bet you can uh, uh so then strains sprains and then once it doesn't hurt you're still injured you're close go that extra mile give it that extra time heal fully could you talk a little bit about uh when you do get a sprain or a strain and you get the swelling i've heard a couple of different schools of thought. Some people say ice it and elevate it. Others say don't ice it. Let the body do what it's supposed to do. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, after decades in the field fixing people and all of the information I've seen, except for one guy, and I'll explain that one, uh, re uh, rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. So you want to rest that injury because now we're talking about you know you have an injury and you know you need to do something about it great let's rest ice it let's get some ice on there because you're going to uh physiologically you are going to arrest a lot of the um cytotoxins that are going to be released by the destruction of the various tissues and you're also going to slow down the blood leaving the uh, blood vessels which then will reduce your swelling right off the bat and keep the blood in the blood vessels and it'll also make it easier for the lymphatic system and the venous system to remove that swelling away from that injury and going back to when you were saying injury behind the knee you most likely did a little bit of damage and uh, sprained your either your acl or your mcl mm -hmm. or, i'm sorry your uh the cruciate ligaments in the back acl uh M mcl i said it right and the swelling was in there and when it's when you get that swelling in there it does not take much for a reduction of your uh, active range of motion. And so you're yeah. directly, you're like, yeah, you were feeling your body really well. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really smart. Where was I right before that? Uh, ice or rice? Ice, right, right. So rest, ice it, 
uh, compression, which means you're going to take that ice and put it on there and wrap it 20 minutes on maximum. If you do more than that, we had a basketball player at Cal State Northridge who we very specifically even sent home instructions with them 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off. You have to let that tissue completely reheat, get back to normal physiological temperatures. He figured if 20 minutes was good, overnight would be better. So in bed, he had a five-gallon bucket of ice water. He put his foot into it. He woke up the next day. It was black up to his knee. Oh, because he had killed his knee and they had to amputate the next day. And then, of course, he was upset, tried to sue. So, what a classic minutes. American thing. If a little bit is good, let's just do a ton of it. <laughs> and unfortunately, not a good approach. for that talented individual, he did not listen to his professionals and chose to do something else. So, 20 minutes. And on hands, even less than that. I'm talking about on, on thigh, your larger areas where it's going to. Uh, take a while for that cool to be assistive and uh you want to get that anybody who's iced in general you get that reddening in the area well the body's getting blood extra blood to that area because it's it's cold we gotta we gotta take care of that so that some of that cold is going to dissipate the rest of it's going to stay there you want that red color don't go black please that would be great mm -hmm. don't go have your body die um and then there is a condition where some individuals who are very susceptible to cold and they can get a sign called it looks like a little wagon wheel it literally first time i saw it i freaked out it was so weird it looks like a wagon's wheel with the spokes mm -hmm. and it's a condition where that individual is very susceptible to cold and you have to be very careful with those individuals they cannot tolerate that level of cold so you have to do there's different modalities that can be then used, but this is beyond the scope of this. So, and then uh, compression, you want to wrap it up. You take off that compression wrap, take out the ice, you rewrap that and you wrap distal to proximal. So this is distal. My feet are distal. They're coming up to the heart is proximal. So you wrap, do I have a, I, I don't have a wrap here i have not injured myself in a bit how very nice uh, so you you wrap starting here and then you wrap coming back up and what that does it assists the flow the return flow of uh, that swelling to get it out of your body so mm -hmm. that can be very very helpful rice rest ice compression elevation never more than 20 minutes ever 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 What's next? Excellent. Hydration, heat. Uh, so can, for can, this then? <laughs> I can make this really fast. I can do it. All right. Hydration. Uh, there are a number of different well, Before we, I, mean, I, wanted, I wanted to say we're jumping to our last category here, which is heat related injuries, of course, which hydration is crucial. So this is going to be our third and, and final grouping. So Attila, run with it. <laughs> A strap in ready go hydration uh again there's a number of different formulas on how to figure out how much fluid you need uh if you feel too full you've drank too much at that time period again i drink a minimum of four liters of water a day when i'm at events i drink more than that because we're sweating we're losing more than that um find a formula practice with it if you don't drink water there's a problem do you change the oil in your car the water in your body is like the oil in a car. If you do not change it, you will have problems. I can guarantee you. Um, heat issues. Go ahead, Bess. So this is going to sound a little odd, but I'm a blood donor. And one of the things I do is I, it's a little game for me. How fast can I bleed today? Oh, same thing. Uh, right? But the phlebotomist was telling me that it actually, I, I was bleeding slowly one day and I said, but I don't understand. I drank a lot of water today. Uh, I was peeing. And she said, it actually, you need to start hydrating the day before because in order to fully hydrate your body, all the muscles and the tissues, you need to start before. So for example, if you're going to an event on a Saturday, you would want to start drinking on a, like intensely drinking on the, the Friday before and keep that up because it takes a while uh, for your body to hydrate. And as you are dehydrating, uh, it's hard to get that back again. So that's just a little something I wanted to tell you about uh, for my blood donor clinics. And I wanted to jump in too. Uh, 
one of my friends when I was younger was a um, uh, former runner. He was a college runner. And he said that their team would would drink about a liter of water. And this may, be, may give you a starting point if you want to learn about or want to try hydration and, and a system for getting hydrated. They would take a drink about a liter of water around 45 minutes before they would compete. Now, drinking this water would start to thin the blood. And I actually experienced this myself. You know, you know how sometimes you go out and you fight and you just feel like you're your body's sluggish and it, it's having a hard time and you run out of breath very quickly. I noticed a big difference when I would drink a liter of water about 45 minutes before I would go out and at, boy, the body just seemed to be running so much smoother. The heart was not pounding as hard. Um, of course, other conditions like heat, um, humidity, a lot of things can influence it, but staying hydrated through, through starting with, early before you get into your performance and through it can make a huge difference. Uh, it'll make you feel like you're more fit because your blood is, your heart is not having to pump thick blood as hard as it would when the blood is thin. Also water, if you're one of those people that's thinking, well, you know, aspirin or blood thinner might do the same thing. Aspirin, even if you just take one, will make your stomach bleed. It's not good to be relying on drugs when all you need to do is drink some water. Water is a very simple solution that's, that does that same thing without having other things going on with your body. So, all right, back to you, Attila. Uh, wait, Bess? Oh, oh, sorry, Bess, you wanted to go with one. Yep. I understand why you got us confused. We look so much better. <laughs> we do. We, uh, people confuse us all the time. Right? It, it's just embarrassing. It's, it, it is a little tough sometimes. One of the things uh, we're talking about water, but you also need to do something to keep the bo uh, the water in your body. So you're going to want your electrolytes, your salt and your potassium. It may come to pass, say you're at a war or a big event and you suddenly find yourself craving potato chips. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, they're delicious. But the other thing is that they are salty and that would help retain the water. And that's something that your body is looking for. Because when we sweat, we sweat these things out. You may have noticed that when you sweat, sometimes there's a white stain. And those that's the salt in your body coming out. And that's something that you really want to maintain. And electrolytes. You can buy things like potassium pills. The largest you can buy is 99 milligrams. Or you could eat a delicious banana, which has a lot of really good things for you. And a large banana will have approximately 400 um, grams of potassium, milligrams of potassium. So it's something to take into consideration. It's not, well, we, we all really want you to drink, but keep in mind, there are things that you can drink to go along with the water. And, and I found that vitamin C is also huge for letting your body actually use the water you're, you're drinking instead of going through it. Uh, I remember at Lily's, uh, years ago, back when it was still hot before all the storms, um, I was drinking so much water. It was, it was flushing my system of the nutrients and I, I, I was still dehydrated, but I was drinking a gallon of water it, it, and I, I came back and all right, I got solved this problem. How, how was I dehydrated when I was drinking so much water? So you're right. That's the electrolytes and the, I think, uh, it's potassium, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, all of these things can help your body use the water you're drinking. So it's not just the water, but it's, it's that other stuff too. Um, Attila, I'd like to wrap up with you describing uh, the difference between heat exhaustion and sure. heat stroke, because I think this is something a lot of people get confused about. Two real quick topics, and the reason that you are having interesting effects from when you do the, the water, everybody experiment, everybody's different, everybody is unique, but experiment with hydration, it's super important. Your blood is over half water. So it's, of course, it's going to change based on what's going on with your body and then going also dovetailing into blood and your hemoglobin, which is iron, uh, vitamin C helps the uptake of iron. So vi uh, having enough of vitamin C is going to make sure that we have properly uh, a proper amount of red blood cells within our blood. And then that's going to help with oxygenation of our, our tissues, which is very important uh, during athletic activities, obviously. Uh, so heat exhaustion heat stroke uh two different conditions both very very uh life-threatening uh more so heat stroke than heat exhaustion you can get cramps from heat and that's normally you're just you're, you're losing water or or you've exerted too hard your muscles can either intermittently cramp or they can do a tonic cramp where they're just staying locked in 
stop your activity, get in the shade, drink some water, relax. If it continues for, you know, more than a couple of minutes, seek help. Um, moving on to heat exhaustion and heat stroke, uh, to very in entirely preventable conditions that still take lives every year. Heat exhaustion. Takeaways on that one, it's due to a loss of water in the body. Heat exhaustion, you look at the person and they they look kind of grayish almost and they're cold and clammy uh, and they're they're sweating like a dog, but they they don't look right. They're not acting right. They could feel nauseous. They're just they're feeling poorly, but they they look like a sweating cadaver. Heat exhaustion. Get them hydrated. Get them in the shade. Just relax them and uh, get them filled back up. Heat stroke. The body's thermoregulating self mechanism, self thermoregulating -re mechanism, is now failing. Their body core is gaining temperature at a rate that they are not allowed. They're not able to bleed off that extra heat. If you do not cool these people down, so these people are going to look red. They're no longer sweating. They're dry. The body is failing. This is an amazingly uh, time critical emergency. Um, they need hydration. They need cooling. That cooling needs to be done in a professional manner. If you you can send them into shock if you drop their core temperature too quickly. A professional, they'll get them into an ice bath. There's a lot of different things, but they also have IVs on them trying to encourage uh, hydro, uh, sweating, hydrosis. Uh, but they, uh, the whereas the heat exhaustion, it's hyperhidrosis, they're sweating buckets. Again, heat stroke, no sweating or very, very limited sweating. The body doesn't even know what to do anymore. It's trying to shed heat and it's failing. All the blood is rushing to the outside. That's why they look so red. And, and so it's no longer removing as much from the core the body doesn't know what to do. It's freaking out. The heat, heat injuries are an emergency situation. So for both of them, you want water, but you, it's most important for heat stroke. You got to cool that person down. If you don't, you could lose them. Uh, you know, the, the cold towels around the neck, we have so, we have five massive um, blood vessels that are going up into the head the arteries themselves, you're going to be able to get a lot of cooling there. Groin is a great place, really uncomfortable, but it, it works really well. You've got the uh, the large uh, femoral arteries on the inside of the thighs there, which can cool down very quickly. But you need to engage EMS if you think somebody has heat stroke. You could lose that person, and it's not hard to do. I've seen cases that have been amazingly close where the doctor's like, maybe another 10 minutes. That person would have been dead. And then as the uh, core temperature goes up, once you get past 104, at least last time I saw any research on it, you're losing brain cells. Once you get to 106, it's bad. And that's internal temperature. Not that you're worrying about taking an internal temperature at that point in time if you're an amateur um, or an unskilled medical individual. Because if you're not a skilled medical individual, realize that you are an unskilled person and you you do not have the knowledge base of somebody who's been trained for years so don't take risks if you're scared ems emergency medical uh, immediately uh or you, you could lose them at any point in time you don't think somebody's acting right something's going weird get them professional care at worst they're saying oh no you didn't have to worry about this one that great okay not a problem let's move along other than that you may have saved a life so don't hesitate to engage ems at worst the worst case scenario is they're put into an ambulance and they're taken to a hospital where the hospital staff goes really why'd you bring them in okay great then they're immediately released so that's what we need to go over on that yeah, one thing I wanted to to yeah. uh, put in there, and because we've talked to, throughout this episode, of, and we're going to wrap up here in just a moment, but uh, prevention, and that is how you design your armor. Realize that there are a few certain points in your body where you will, if you wrap them up tightly, for example, the neck, 
if you've got a heavy gorget with padding on it that's acting like a, a wool scarf, if you have heat problems, that's going to uh, exacerbate the heat issues. Um, the other one that I found, because I'm fairly sensitive to heat being a northerner, um, is the kidneys. If you wrap, I found that if I wrap my kidneys up and they start to heat up, my whole body heats up. And so, you know, when I would travel south, like to, to usually Lily's, because it was hotter than Hades down there, um, I found that tuning, making sure that my armor allowed my neck to breathe more and allowed my kidneys to breathe. And, and I made my armor so that it was uh, protective. It had, the, it had the, the hard over soft, but it wasn't, it didn't act like I was wrapping my whole body up in a, in a wool blanket. That helped immensely. So preventing, not only preventing uh, the, the heat issues by how you design your armor, but also make sure you know where you're going into and that your armor was, is designed for that area. Uh, I remember when I moved to Anstiora and I took my uh, the armor that I was comfortable wearing in Minnesota to Texas. I got laughed at when I pulled that out and and put on my big gamazon and everything. And you know, most everybody there was wearing a sleeveless T-shirt with a with a kidney belt, and that was their armor. And they're like, "What are you wearing?" So um, between that and Lilies, I found out real quick how to how to design armor to to suit the environment to avoid these heat is issues. But um, yeah, if you if you do, and I, I saw this a number of times down at Lily's, they'd have a lot of people come down and overheat. And the first thing is get them out of their their body armor. Like their armor may be contributing to the overheating issue. Uh, and Attila's from uh, Calentir, so he, maybe you can. Yeah, uh, I was I lived in Calentir for about twelve and a half years. Lily's was always a concern. I I do wet bulb temperature to find out. I mean, some days it's like no, you, we can't fight today. We just can't. I uh, I was fighting a friend of mine, uh, uh, Simyaka, and I looked over and he's just not responding normally. And I'm like, hold. And I'm like, I walk over to him. It's like, Simi, how you doing? He's like, hey, Attila. Not normal behavior. If people are acting weird, there's normally a reason. And oftentimes it's because something's going on that we need to be careful of. We called a hold. Everybody was out the field. We marched probably 15 people off into the shade to get them watered. And it's 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 grueling. You have to be very careful. We thermoregulate poorly as we age. The older we get, the less heat we can shed, the less warm we can get because we lose our brown fat versus our yellow fat. All of these things are super important. And the exact opposite from going north to south was me going and doing some training in uh, uh, Europe and we went up to a fighter tournament, a fighter practice, fighter camp in Sweden. I had Lily's armor. I literally fought in a vest and I was in southern Sweden with a literal Arctic breeze or wind, whatever, uh, in, in a vest. I was freezing. So I fought an awful lot just to stay alive. So know what, know what you have, know where you're going. If it's different, it's going to be different. Altitude is also really important. I know we're shy on thoughts, time. Um, if you go to 9,000 feet and you're from the ocean, fight one fight and stop. And then fight another fight. If you're not used to altitude, your blood is is effectively thin there. You will not have the hemoglobin to be able to support that level of activity. So thanks for listening. Yeah. Drink a lot of water. Armor up. If you keep getting hit in the same spot, you don't have enough armor there. Don't get hurt. If you do, take the time to heal. Did I say drink water? Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> and, and have a lot of fun. Thanks. Excellent. Well, I wanted to wrap this show up. Uh, this is one of those episodes that we we did bite off more than we could chew. Uh, it's a it's a both a broad subject and a deep subject uh, in talking about injuries and all that we covered. And there's things we didn't cover like cramps and Charlie horses and all the other uh, other things. There's just a bunch. Hopefully, this gave you a good uh, framework to at least open your mind a bit more to what could happen for injuries, what to keep your eyes open for. And even more so, the, crack the door open to start learning more and finding out more. Uh, realize that you are an athlete. Um, you may not be a, a, even a semi-pro one or even a talented amateur one, but you're still an athlete and you need to take care of your body. Uh, and, do, and in doing that, know what happens 
uh, or how to at least spot when things are starting to go wrong and not just wait for chronic pain or extreme pain to remind you that something's an issue. Um, my wife always used the term, listen to your body, learn to listen to it and, and learn its language. Um, so these are some, some good tips for, for any, any athletic activity, really. Um, so I guess with that, we'll let, uh, if you want to both share final thoughts, uh, Beth, we'll go to you first and go right ahead. So, uh, I'd like to think that tonight you've learned about injuries and how to prevent them. Uh, Penzik is on my mind and we've talked about lilies and other big wars. So worst comes to worst, you have to go to the hospital. I would encourage you all to do one last little preventative thing, put all your medical information in an envelope sealed so nobody else has access to it. And perhaps everybody in your camp can store them in one spot. When Penzik is, or the war is over, you can take them home and no harm, no foul. But if somebody does need to go and we had a uh, heat stroke in my camp one year, uh, we had all the medical information ready to go and uh, saved a lot of time, you know, calling spouses or digging through tents, not know, knowing where everything was. So that's my my last little tip for y'all. Very good tip. Adila, do you want to uh, finish with anything else? Uh, hydration. Get an anatomy physiology book. Learn your body. Be good to yourself. Drink water. Drink more water. Be healthy. <laughs> Very good. Attila, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It was great to have you on the show. Uh, great insights. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth and uh, Nicolina. If you're out there somewhere at your meeting, uh, thank you for coming. Um, and until next week, I guess we'll see you again on the Coach's Corner. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah, bye -bye. Good night.